Hi, my name is JC. In April of 2022, I was diagnosed with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, also known as SIRS or SEERS. And since then, I've done a lot of research. Hey, it's editing JC here. I realized I forgot the most important part. SIRS is what happens when someone who is genetically predisposed to being really bad at eliminating a biotoxin encounters that biotoxin. So without further ado, let's get into the video. When I was first told that I might have this, I was very skeptical. I'm a skeptical person by nature. And when I looked online, all of the information was very provider facing, which was reassuring in the sense that it seemed like it had a lot of science behind it. But at the same time, with my SIRS brain, and if you have SIRS, you may know this, the brain fog is intense. It feels like you're thinking through mud. And it was really hard for me to understand the information I was seeing. Since initially being diagnosed, I have read the textbook, I've watched all of the lectures, and I've learned a lot along the way. So while I'm not a provider, I'm going to do my best to explain SIRS in a way that is easier to understand for the layman and hopefully easier to understand for somebody who is actually dealing with chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I'll go ahead and leave my favorite SIRS research resources in the description box down below. Like I said, there is a textbook. It's pretty dense, but very informative. There's a really great lecture series by Dr. Andrew Heyman here on YouTube, and then there are also tons of different articles and pieces of information on survivingmold.com. Chronic inflammatory response syndrome is also known as mold illness. It was accidentally discovered by Dr. Richie Shoemaker in the 1990s. There was an outbreak of algae in the bay near the small town that he was a family practitioner in, and he just found that he had an increase in patients with really weird symptoms. They were multi-system, multi-symptom presentation of whatever was happening. Eventually, he had a patient who had secretory diarrhea. That sounds so fun. Um, but he decided to treat them with an old school cholesterol med because he knew it would work to actually help constipate them. And he was surprised to find that their other symptoms improved as well. Eventually that led him down the rabbit hole of discovering biotoxin illness and biotoxins in general. And since then, he's actually done a ton of clinical studies about SIRS and his SIRS protocol. So if SIRS is triggered by biotoxins, uh, we should touch on what those can be. We already mentioned algae. Um, another huge one is mold. That's the most common one. But you can also get it from things like bacteria or spider bites. Lyme disease is a huge one. So why is it that some people can be exposed to the same biotoxin and be fine? Well, Dr. Richie Shoemaker found out that there is a genetic aspect where you're predisposed to being really bad at eliminating biotoxins. You can be predisposed to being bad at eliminating none, some, or all of the biotoxins. If you are genetically predisposed to being really bad at eliminating a biotoxin, your immune system doesn't respond normally to those biotoxins. Normally what happens is when a toxin enters our body, we have an innate immune response that kind of releases a generalized force to deal with that toxin. Eventually, once the toxin is identified, the innate immune system hands off the immune response to the adaptive immune system, which will create things like antibodies to help you eliminate the toxin. With people who have SIRS, they're genetically predisposed to being really bad at that handoff. The antibodies are never generated by the adaptive immune system, and so the biotoxin is never eliminated. What ends up happening is not only do you have this biotoxin recirculating in your body, but you have an overwhelming and catastrophic immune response. There are lots of different symptoms associated with SIRS. It's known as a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. There are over 37 symptoms used in the diagnostic criteria for SIRS. They actually arrange them into different clusters. And if you have eight of the 13 clusters, meaning you have at least one symptom in the cluster that would count towards your symptom cluster count, um, you very likely have SIRS. Another thing that can happen when you have SIRS is it can trigger other disorders. For me, it triggered an autoimmune condition called ankylosing spondylitis, but it can also trigger things like 
celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, other types of arthritic conditions, psoriasis, any autoimmune condition, SIRS can trigger. With SIRS, there's a clear diagnostic path to understanding if you have SIRS and if you should treat SIRS. The first step is seeing how many of the symptoms you have. Now, as I said before, eight of the 13 means you very likely have SIRS. You can have less than that, but if SIRS still feels like the right fit for you, you can kind of pursue further investigation. And the way that you would do that is there is a, something called a VCS test. It's the visual contrast study. With people who have SIRS, we know that they have inflammation circulating in their body, and that inflammatory junk can actually clog up the tiny capillaries in the back of your eye, making it difficult to see blurred lines. The VCS test is a quick and easy way to see if you might have SIRS. If you fail it, you're very likely to have SIRS. However, if you pass it, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have SIRS, especially for people who are artists or depend on their eyesight to tell color variations. They may have more of a training or ability to actually see those blurred lines. Ultimately, it's just another indicator that perhaps you should look into this further. The last step is blood work. And there's two different types or genres of blood work that they really look into when you think you may have SIRS. The first is your genetic predisposition, so they will actually identify the haplotypes and therefore the biotoxins you may be susceptible to. And then the second part of the blood work is checking for that innate immune response and those inflammatory markers. Now, personally, I went ahead and did the diagnostic part with a nutritionist, and then eventually she handed me off to a shoemaker certified practitioner. The reason you need a shoemaker certified practitioner is that the shoemaker protocol is the only clinically proven path to healing from SIRS. Personally, I found my provider by going to survivingmold.com. All of the shoemaker certified providers have to submit an essay about kind of their practice philosophy and values. I found that very helpful because I could see which providers I would vibe with. So as I said, the shoemaker protocol is the only clinically proven path to healing from SIRS. The first part is a foundational step. You do have to remove yourself from the exposure environment. So in the case of something like Lyme, you might need to treat the Lyme first. If you think you may be in a moldy residence, you should test and then either move or remediate so that you're not in that constant biotoxin exposure state. The second step is taking the binders. So the binders are typically cholestyramine, Wellcol, and there are some more natural alternatives you can take if you don't handle those binders well. As you go down the line, they're less and less effective. The reason that you need these specific binders and can't use generic binders like charcoal or clay are, is that biotoxins are very specifically charged and they need a certain receptor site to cling to on the binders. Cholestyramine and Wellcol are correctly charged and have the correct binder site size to help you eliminate the biotoxins. A good portion of the Shoemaker protocol is actually addressing the downstream effects of the SIRS. So while the binders will help you get rid of the biotoxins, you may have some residual aftermath to take care of through other supportive therapies and medications. So some things that may need correction are things like hormones, electrolyte balance, GI healing. And then the very last step is something called VIP spray. This stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide. By doing this spray, patients are able to feel normal again. That's actually the clinical standard for taking them off of the VIP spray. And what this does is it actually turns off a lot of the genes that SIRS can errantly turn on, triggering things like autoimmune conditions. Beyond the protocol, even if you eliminate the biotoxin, you're still genetically predisposed to really sucking at eliminating biotoxins, and so you still have this lifelong risk of exposure. So when we're talking about SIRS patients, we do have to talk about lifelong maintenance. But it doesn't have to be overwhelming. The first step is to know your triggers, know what your exposure events might look like. So if you have your genetic haplotypes, you can understand, oh, I'm sensitive to mold, I'm sensitive to lime, I'm sensitive to all of the things. So to minimize exposure, you might want to do things like avoid water damaged buildings. If you are lime susceptible, you might want to avoid walking through tall grass where there may be ticks. 
If you are someone who is mold sensitive, there are some kind of hacks you can do. One is using an asthma peak flow meter in order to see what your um, breath rate or your flow rate looks like in a quote unquote safe environment. And then actually using that meter in unknown environments to see if it's impacting your respiratory system at all. You can also travel with an air purifier, but really the most important thing is to have a plan in place with your provider so that if you are exposed, you can get back on binders and actually taking care of SIRS after you've done the full treatment protocol. You don't have to do the treatment protocol as long each time you're exposed. You can kind of take the binder for a couple of weeks and you may be back to normal. You may have to do the VIP spray, but you'll work out all those details with your provider. The last thing I'll say is that uh, as someone who has SIRS and kind of went down this journey last year, I know that this can seem really overwhelming um, but SIRS, at least for me, it was a hope for healing that I never thought I could have. Uh, I really thought I would be in pain and not feel like myself for the rest of my life. And so I just saw it as this awesome opportunity to actually pursue healing and not just symptom management for the rest of my life. And the coolest part is that there is a clinically proven path to success. In my own story, I was diagnosed April of 2022. I started treatment in June of 2022. It is now January of 2023. I'm about halfway through my treatment protocol and I am feeling a million percent better. Through this process, I was actually diagnosed at the same time as my best friend. And so we just found it so helpful to have each other to lean on for support and to help each other understand all of the information. We ended up creating a private online community called the SIRS Group. So if you're looking for additional resources and support on your own SIRS journey, you're welcome to join us. I'll go ahead and leave the link in the description box down below. I hope this was helpful. If you or someone you know is dealing with SIRS, I just wish you the best of luck. I wish you love, peace, healing, and I hope you have a really great day. I'll see you all in the next one. Okay, bye.